All right. Let me uh, review a couple of the announcements before we go forward. Uh, registration for Chafer Seminary courses ends tomorrow, uh, which is the 21st, I believe, yes, and it ends tomorrow. And then our annual congregational meeting is scheduled for uh, February the 6th, immediately following the morning worship service, and then... Um, and we need, it's good if everybody comes, but we need to have 50% uh, quorum, uh, that is 50% of our members here. So if possible, if you are a member, please plan to be here so we can go over all the, all the information. The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder, the soul and the spirit, and the joints from the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped, thoroughly furnished for every good work. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we begin our study this evening, let's take some time for silent prayer to make sure we're in right relationship with the Lord and confess sin if necessary. And after a few moments of silent prayer, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful again that we can come before you as a body of believers, studying your word, focusing on what you have revealed for us, and in this series, learning about your word, the, your faithfulness in revealing your word to us through the prophets of the Old Testament and apostles and prophets in the New Testament. And in your provision for us, you have given us a sufficient revelation may not answer all of our questions. It might not deal with everything that we think we need to know, but it provides us with, a, uh, with everything that we do need to know in order to handle the issues of life. Father, we pray that tonight as we continue this study looking at uh, the evidence for the Bible that is left in the uh, archaeological uh, remains, Father, help us to understand these, these things that we learn and see how you have, uh, contrary to every uh, false religious system, you've grounded your revelation in history and in reality, and therefore there, there are remains that uh, validate and c confirm in a general way the truth of your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, what I want to do tonight and next week is to go through several things, focus on a couple of key ones that are important in terms of uh, biblical archaeology. And it's interesting because as I was looking back through what I taught some uh, almost not quite 20 years ago, about 17 years ago, I realized that back then I had never been to Israel. And since then, I have been to Israel 10 times. I have um, volunteered for one whole day working on a dig and gotten a tad bit of experience. But I have walked through several of these important sites uh, with archaeologists and spent a lot of time just looking at trying to understand all of the different issues and what the various debates and everything are all about. And it just makes a huge difference once you have gone there and actually walked on these sites. There's not a single place in the Book of Mormon, not a single geographic location that exists anywhere in the real world. And you can't find another religious book that is, even, is grounded in history at all. But when you look at the Bible, it is a historical book. It is revealed to us by the God of history, the God who 
uh, has created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. He is a God who is omniscient. He knows all of the knowable. He is a God who is omnipotent. He is able to do anything and everything beyond anything we can possibly uh, think or ask. And therefore, when he reveals himself, he reveals himself within the space-time continuum, within the flow of history, and there are, as it were, footprints left in the... um, you know, left in, in, in the history of the world that we can see that give evidence. In fact, that was important in the Old Testament that in the tests for a prophet to evaluate, if someone said, well, God told me to say this, that that would be validated in some way, that it wasn't just based upon somebody saying, well, God told me this. Now, we know that there are a lot of charlatans, there have been a lot of false teachers and a lot of false prophets down through the ages, and we can think of a number of them, like Joseph Smith and Brigham Young with the Mormons and with Mary Baker, Glover, Patterson, Eddy with the uh, Christian scientists. And we know that, that they're just making up their own religion. We can think of Muhammad, Uh, almost identical to what happened with Joseph Smith going to um, (coughs) excuse me going to Mount uh, Cumora up in near Palmyra, New York where the angel Moroni reveals to him the Book of Mormon he can't read it, he has to put on his magical glasses so that he can interpret it and you can't find any any substantial evidence to anything that he says. The closest you get in Islam is uh, Mecca and a few physical sites in the, um, in the Quran, but the Quran doesn't even mention Jerusalem. So it is also a non-historical historical book. But we, when we get to the Bible, there is evidence that God has spoken and that the more that we dig and the more that we work on things, the more that we, we discover. So that's why we're asking this question that Satan asked Eve in the garden, has God really said? And the answer is yes, he has. He has spoken clearly. So tonight we're going to look at what does archaeology uh, contribute. And I want to lead off with a quotation from a liberal archaeologist who basically expresses the human viewpoint understanding of the Bible. And it is, this is the kind of thing that you will hear from people with advanced degrees, PhDs, maybe multiple PhDs, and some of them are archaeologists, and they've worked in Israel, and they seem to have the experience And what they discover or fail to discover makes the headlines. But when you look at the work of people, like the work of the uh, Association or Associates of Biblical Research, ABR, uh, you can write that down, Associates of Biblical Research. They have a journal that they publish called uh, Bible in Spade. And it is not an overly technical journal like uh, uh, Biblical Archaeology Review or Biblical Archaeologists, which are of a more liberal slant. Uh, Bible and Spade is much more foundational, and those folks take the Word of God as the inerrant revealed Word of God, and so they tend to find things right where God says they were in the time period that God said they were. The trouble with uh, many archaeologists is that they have uh, skewed the timeline. And then when, if you've skewed the timeline and you say, well, Moses lived in the uh, uh, 12th century, in the 1100s, and you go to the 12th century and you don't find any evidence of Moses or the Jews being in, Israel, in uh, Egypt or anything like that, then you've confirmed your prejudices. But if you look in the right place, which is the 15th century, actually I said, uh, I said 10th, uh, 12th century earlier, the 1200s and the 13th century is the liberal view of the Exodus. If you look in the 15th century, 
there's evidence. And people like Doug Petrovich, people like the archaeologists that work with ABR, a uh, number of others uh, are discovering the evidence of Israel being in Egypt at that right and appropriate time. So in this quote, this archaeologist says, archaeology did not illumine the times and events of Abraham, Moses, and Joshua. Rather, it helped to show that these times and events are largely unhistorical. The more we know about the Bronze and early Iron Ages, the more the biblical portrayals of events in this era appear to be a blend of folklore and cultural memory, in which the details of historical events have either disappeared or been radically reshaped. The stories are deeply meaningful, but only occasionally historical. Archaeological research has, against the intentions of most of its practitioners, secured the non-historicity of much of the Bible before the era of the kings. And that's just a lie in every sentence. It's just not true. So we have to understand the other side of that story. There have, in fact, been a vast number of archaeological discoveries over the years that have demonstrated that the conjectures of those like the writer of that paragraph uh, they, that uh, indicate the uniqueness of the Bible and, that, and the authority of the Bible is with foundation. So what I want to do is basically look at three things. The first two are on this slide, the third one's in the next slide. The first one is the role of archaeology in biblical study and validation. You know, so the, the archaeology can't prove anything for anybody in archaeology in any era. All it can do is give evidence of certain things. There has to be a general historical knowledge in order to put things together and to see that. So the art, role of archaeology is not going to prove the Bible, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Second, we're going to examine a number of key discoveries this week and next week. And we could spend a lot of time on each one of these. I'm going to spend you know, 15 or 20 minutes, maybe a little more on Jericho as we get to the end tonight because that is considered the most significant challenge to biblical, tr biblical veracity that's out there. So that's, that's the most important. But there's so many things that are coming up that we need to know where can we go to find information and who, whom can we trust. So I've got three people here that I find very trustworthy, and I know each of them personally. Of course, you all know that I've known Randy Price for uh, over 50 years, and long before either one of us had a clue as to what we were going to be doing. And I have known Titus Kennedy for probably a good 10 years at least, I know his father, Todd Kennedy, who is, was the founding pastor, I think, of Spokane Bible Church, just a very good Bible teacher. Some of you know Todd. I know there's a couple of people here that were in a Bible study that he had right back at Washington State. You guys weren't in that? Okay, I thought you were. Yeah, there were, there were quite a few that went through uh, Bible studies that he had. He was in graduate school uh, studying veterinary medicine at the time, and then he went on to, to Dallas Seminary, and his son has gotten an excellent education, got his Ph.D. in archaeology from the University of South Africa, and he's published two books, Unearthing the Bible, 101 Discoveries that Bring the Bible to Life, and in March of 2022, in about, in about just under two months, they're going to release his second book, Excavating the Evidence for Jesus. So that's Titus. I skipped over Randy. Randy's got a couple of books on archaeology. One he wrote with Wayne House, uh, and it's called The Zondervan Handbook of Biblical Archaeology. And then he wrote a book that came out in the 90s called The Stones Cry Out. So it's not as up-to-date 
And when I look on my shelf and compare some of the things that I've learned in the last 15 years going to Israel with what were in uh, these books I bought in the 70s and 80s, I realize that they are in many ways dated because there's been so much either added to what was known at that time or more has been discovered. One of those examples is Sodom and Gomorrah. The sort of the traditional location is at a place on the east side of the Dead Sea at a place called Bab Edra. And there are a number of people who still hold to that site for some very good reasons. And uh, Randy Price holds to that still. He always takes his, uh, often takes his tour groups. When they go to Jordan, they go down, and it's quite a hike to get down into that area. And, but they usually go there. And I, uh, Bryant Wood, who I'll mention tonight when we're talking about Jericho, who is now retired, I think he has some form of cancer and had to retire from um, the Associates of Biblical Research, Bible and Spade, but he did a tremendous amount of work and he does not accept this new site. Now they've dis there's a discovery of a new site, the name of which always escapes me, but it is on the north, north east corner of the Dead Sea. Out and it's not in the Dead Sea, but near the Dead Sea. The one thing I think that it has in its favor is that there's a statement in the scripture that you, they could see Sodom from near Shechem. You can't see the other location from there. But there are a number of other things that don't fit that northern site at all. So that's the problem that we have in several places. We just don't have enough evidence. It's not that, uh, it's like when you have uh, two different readings in, uh, the, in different uh, manuscripts of the Bible and you have to compare, look at all the evidence, and you might, neither one might be right uh, in terms of the archeology. span So I didn't, whereas I included a lot about Sodom, uh, the last time I taught this, I'm. That's all I'm going to say about it right now because I think it's still up in the air in terms of their, the debate that's going on there. So Randy's got his book, The Stones Cry Out, which is quite good, and, good, and then Joel Kramer. Now, we, I met Joel about almost, 20, almost 10 years ago by, by email. He was supposed to take me, uh, guide me into uh, Samaria at that time, and then at the last minute he got called in for an interview for his visa, so he had to uh, cancel, but he said, I have a good uh, a guy I know here that's also in the uh, graduate program, and uh, you'll, he'll, he'll do a great job, and that was Andrew Cross, and Andrew did a great job, and his father's John Cross with Goodseed, which I never even connected that with the last name. Cross is not exactly a an uncommon name, and so that was great to see him. And those three men, Titus Kennedy, Joel Kramer, and Andrew Cross, were all studying in Israel at the same time. And Joel, both Andrew, when I met him in 2012, and Joel, when I met him in 2014, told me that they were the only ones that they really trusted to stick to the Bible. And the problem is that young guys who believe the Bible go over there, but they don't know enough. And they get overwhelmed by the liberal views of their uh, unbelieving Jewish professors at the Hebrew University or any of the other uh, universities that are there that do provide a great education, but their presupposition is it varies. You know, some do believe the Bible generally is accurate, like the uh, Mazars, both father and daughter, have discovered a lot of things in Jerusalem. They've discovered what is believed to be the, the king's palace, David's palace in the old city of, of uh, David. They've also discovered what they believe to be uh, some of the other areas that are mentioned in the, in the city of David and a lot of artifacts. They've discovered the wall that was built by Nehemiah, 
And all of these things just gen give general confirmation to the historicity of, of the Bible. But there are a group of archaeologists that are referred to as minimalists, and these minimalists reject the whole assumption that anything in the Bible is true, like the quote that, that I gave you. And yet there are, for example, for a long time, the minimalists would say there's absolutely no evidence uh, that a David ever existed, no evidence that an Abraham ever existed, and yet there was an uh, inscription, which I'll show you next time, discovered at Tel Dan in the north that mentions the house of David. That's kind of hard to have a dynasty of David because that's what the phrase refers to if you don't have a David. Uh, and, but in their view, all of these figures were just made up out of thin air. Now, the first thing I want to look at is the role of archaeology. And when we look at archaeology, it has a validating aspect when it comes to Scripture. We can't prove or disprove anything by archaeology because it's a, it's a nonverbal uh, media. Uh, what, what it tells us is certain, certain general things about the people who once lived there. We can't use the word proof because the word proof has the idea of that you have, conf you have proven the Bible to be true. How would you prove it to be true? You prove it to be true by appealing to some higher law. Well, is there a higher law than God? No. So using a word like proof is, a, is an erroneous concept. It's validated. We have seen, you know, I've talked about Qumran, and we'll come back, I'll say a few more things about Qumran when we talk about how we got the Bible, the transmission of the text. But when you look at Qumran, it, 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 and you look at other discoveries like those at Ebla, and some of the other locations, it talks about people who have the same kind of names as the people in the Bible. They dress the same way. They have the same kind of customs. In fact, it helps us to understand some of the things, some of the customs in the Bible, some of the things they did. And the Bible doesn't always explain that, but we come to find out that these were common in the, in the ancient world. So it gives us um, a confirmation that what the Bible is describing in the way people lived in the uh, second millennium or in the third millennium B.C., that's the period between 3000 B.C. and 2000 B.C., conforms to what we are finding. And if you hold to liberal views saying that none of the Bible was written until after the return from Babylon, after uh, 538 B.C., then how would people, because they didn't have all the archaeological evidence like, like we do, how would people in you know, 500 years before Jesus know how people lived and wrote and what their customs were uh, 2,000 years earlier? But when you go back and read Genesis, the way the patriarchs lived, some of their customs are exactly what we find and various archaeological discoveries. So we don't prove the Bible in the sense that we would prove something in a science laboratory, but we can validate and verify certain claims that the Bible makes or in the way it describes the culture and history at the time. In John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says, If I have told you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? He's setting forth an argument that if the things that, the, that he talked about that you could verify by looking around and, and seeing the physical things and confirming it that way, that would verify that what he said about the things you couldn't see and, and, uh, and prove, that that was also true. Because when Jesus spoke, he, when he spoke about earthly things, you could confirm that. 
And so Jesus said, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? In Mark chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, we see an example of this when Jesus heals the paralytic. He's in Peter's house, and these, there's a big crowd in Capernaum that's surrounding the house, and these men have brought their friend who's paralyzed, brought him to the house, and they can't get in, so they go up on the roof, and they pull back the roof, and they lower him into the room so that Jesus will heal him. And when Jesus heals him, uh, he says, also says to him, son, your sins are forgiven you. And this just makes the Pharisees and the scribes just go ballistic. He just really triggers them because no human being can forgive sin. But Jesus has, has healed him uh, as, a, as a paralyzed man, and everybody knew that he could not walk, that he was paralyzed. Jesus has completely healed him so that the physical evidence of his healing will validate the more difficult thing, which is uh, forgiving his sins. So archaeology is a an, two things, an inexact science. In fact, w- it may seem strange to you, but many people think that we are still in the infancy of archaeology. So it is. So we're looking at very, very few, um, very, very few remains at all, and so it's very limited into what it what it can demonstrate and what it can validate. People say, "Well, has, can archaeology prove X, Y, or Z? Can it prove that Jesus healed the paralytic? Can it prove this?" No, it can't do that, but it can demonstrate that there is a hardcore tradition going back to the first century that Peter lived in a certain location. Well, how can, how can it prove that? Well, if the archaeologists dug up this one area, it was under a church, so they marked the location was mark, marked by a church, and when they excavated to the house to the level at the first century, they found that people would come and they would, um, just like they do today, they would leave graffiti on the wall. And so they would uh, say, say certain things indicating that they were coming there uh, as, as a place to worship because this was, Jesus had lived in Capernaum and this was where uh, Peter lived. And so the tradition is backed up by uh, inscriptional evidence. And there have been churches that were built over that site from century to century. So that gives a certain amount of validation. Now, one way to illustrate what archaeology does is, let's say you go to the store and you get one of these, you find a box, or no, you don't go to the store, but let's say you find a box, and it's got a picture on it, it's a jigsaw puzzle, And you open the box, and there's only 10 pieces, but it's a 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. Now, if all you have is those 10 pieces, you can't figure out a whole lot about how they fit into the puzzle. You don't even know what the picture is unless you have the box top that gives you the picture of, uh, of the puzzle. And then if you have that picture of the puzzle, you can take your, um, you can take those 10 pieces and you can figure out where they go in that puzzle. And because you have that puzzle, that's your absolute reference point. It gives meaning and significance to the different pieces. And that's a lot like uh, archaeology and the Bible. The Bible gives us the overall narrative, tells us the story, tells us what is going on, and that gives meaning to the things that, that are found in the archaeological excavation. 
often you'll find that when archaeologists are not paying attention to the Bible, or even if they are, if they have a, an out-of-whack chronological system, then they're going to get things out of order. But if you have, and that's why people spend a lot of time trying to work out the chronology in the Bible, then if you have that chronology and you can uh, put the pieces, put the evidence into the right time frame, then it's also going to give uh, meaning to the give meaning to those things. And we don't have other cultures that have a book like the Bible that can provide that kind of a overview and that kind of a narrative that's used to uh, interpret the these bits and pieces. That, that we discover. And the result is that those who don't think the Bible gives them any information are ending up with just speculation and confusion, and there's a lot of debates and disagreements as to just what is going on. So archaeology is an inexact science. It's in its infancy. Uh, Edwin Yamauchi, who was a w very well-known Old Testament scholar and uh, wrote various things related to ancient Near Eastern cultures and, uh, and archaeology said that when you go to Israel and you go to the Middle East, only 1% has been excavated. Only 1%. And what has been excavated, and when we get to Jericho, I'll show you a chart of what was actually excavated at Jericho because a lot of it was not excavated. Only um, a small portion of what has been excavated has, has really been uh, thoroughly excavated, just as a small portion. And of that small percentage of the sites that have been excavated, only a very small portion has been, uh, has been reported, has been published on. And that very small percentage has usually not made it out into the popular literature that most people can pick up a book and read about. One of the things, some of you know about this, that, um, uh, that I learned from watching Joel Kramer's uh, video and talk on the Praetorium and the location of the Praetorium, uh, that uh, this was exca thoroughly excavated. You can't see anything today about what it was because once you go through an excavation, you, you, you've removed everything. Everything's gone. And so there was a, the primary excavation on this location was in the seven, uh, in the 1970s. It's never been published. Everything that they found is still in a warehouse. The um, professor under whom he did his study was a man named uh, Shimon. I can't remember his last name. Shimon will come to me in a minute. Anyway. He has a, um, he was there and he cataloged things, but they've never been published. They've never gone through all, everything that they took out of the excavation. And that's just one small place. So when you think of how many other digs there have been and how much has been, uh, has to be cataloged. And I know that Randy's still working on a lot of stuff that, that they excavated out on the Qumran uh, Plateau. So the amount of stuff that we've discovered archaeologically is just minuscule compared to the amount that is still under the ground. The New International Dictionary of Biblical Archaeology has in its preface the statement, the purpose of biblical archaeology is to recover material remains of man's past, not to prove the accuracy or historicity of the Bible. Nevertheless, it's important to note that Near Eastern archaeology has demonstrated the historical and geographical reliability of the Bible in many important areas. By clarifying the objectivity and factual accuracy of biblical authors, archaeology also helps correct the, the view that the Bible is avowedly partisan and subjective. It is now known, for instance, that along with the Hittites, Hebrew scribes were the best historians in the entire ancient Near East, despite contrary propaganda that emerged from Assyria, Egypt, and elsewhere. 
In the late 19th, uh, in the 19th century, there were those two men, uh, Julius Wellhausen and Graf, who set forth a theory on, called the documentary hypothesis, which I covered uh, two or three lessons ago. And that view argued that uh, one of the primary reasons that they substantiated it was they said that Moses could not possibly have written the Pentateuch because they weren't writing at that time. And they didn't have law codes like that at that time when Moses allegedly lived. Uh, but they did, uh, since not long after that, they discovered uh, the Black Steely, which contained the cuneiform law code of Hammurabi, who predated Moses by 300 years. And since then, you have these other uh, discoveries at Ebla and Bogazkoi, in 1927, up to 1927, liberals were saying, well, the Bible just made up the Hittites. Nobody ever heard about the Hittites. There's nobody in the ancient world that ever names the Hittites. The Hittites are a figment of the Bible's imagination. And then in 1927, they discovered Bogazkoy, which was in Turkey, in central Turkey, and it, that was the capital city of the Hittite Empire. And so there have been numerous other things on a much smaller scale that, that have been true. On the article in Archaeology in the Unger Bible Dictionary, they state that the creation and flood epics that, came, that were discovered in Assyria and in Babylon were edited uh, in his day and have descended to us in the form that they took under his reign, that is the reign of Hammurabi. Uh, they date from about 640 B.C., and they were found in the library of Ashurbanipal, a Syrian king at Nineveh. I learned something in my Hebrew class not long ago as we were going through uh, Jonah. That, you know, Jonah, Jonah's the guy who didn't want to go to Nineveh because he hated the Assyrians, and so he got on a boat, and he was going out and uh, headed to Spain, Tarshish, and uh, eventually the, the, God sent a storm. The sailors threw Jonah overboard uh, against their own protest, but Jonah said, no, throw me overboard. And God, had, uh, God brought along a great fish. So Jonah turns to God in repentance. The fish vomits him up on the shore, and he goes from that fish to the next fish because the root meaning of Nineveh is fish. So that's just one of the many ways God inserts a lot of humor in the text. You could subtitle Jonah from fish to fish. So at Nineveh, that was also the capital of the Assyrian, that was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. They discovered uh, Hammurabi's uh, black stele from the city of Ur, Ur of the Chaldees, and it was in both the Semitic and Sumerian languages. That way they could translate the Sumerian. Uh, Hammurabi is famous in a large part for his uh, code of laws, which was discovered in 1901 to 1902 by Jacques de Morgan at, at Susa, which is in the area of Iraq, uh, where it had been carried by Elamite raiders. The famous code offers interesting parallels to Pentateuchal laws preceding them by at least three centuries and adapted to an urban irrigation culture in contrast to the simple agrarian culture in Palestine. And then one last quote here by Nelson Gluck, who was no conservative, and he's considered one of the greatest biblical archaeologists of the 20th century, said that all that I have ever said is that in all of my archaeological investigation, I have never found one artifact of antiquity that contradicts any statement of the Word of God. So what have we learned as we have looked at archaeology? Well, first of all, let's look at creation. In the excavation of Nineveh and the library of Ashurbanipal, his dates are 668 to 626 B.C., they found a set of seven tablets called the Creation Epic. And the Creation Epic listed six days of creation and one day of rest. 
Also, they found the Babylonian creation epic, which is known as Enuma Elish. On the latter basis, people argue that the Bible just revised pagan myth. That's common view of liberal theologians. Well, the Bible is just imitating the pagans. They revised it, maybe made it a little more monotheistic, but it, it's this evolution of religion. Rather than taking what the Bible says and said everybody who got off the boat with Noah was a monotheist. And what happened is over the generations they got away from God and developed other gods and goddesses, worshipped nature, uh, tried to create a globalist society and God had to punish them and scatter their languages. So uh, this scholar, A.R. Millard, uh, states... All who suspect of, all who suspect or suggest a borrowing by the Hebrews are compelled to admit large-scale revision, alteration, large-scale revision, alteration, and reinterpretation in a fashion which cannot be substantiated for any other composition from the ancient Near East or in any other Hebrew writing. And it's fascinating when I, back in 1978, I had I was an Old Testament Hebrew major, and so if you're an Old Testament Hebrew major, whatever field your major is in, when you're in when, when you're in seminary, you took a, I think you had to take five electives. So I thought uh, that semester biblical archaeology was being offered, and that was being taught by. Uh, Dr. Ken Barker, who was one, the chief editor, general editor of the NIV translation over all the Old Testament committees. And on the front row, there was a guy named Steve Sullivan. Steve is retiring this year from 30 years of teaching at College of Biblical Studies here. Some of you know Steve. He's a pre-trib every, every year. And then next to Steve was Randy Price, and then I was next to Randy, and we sat right in front of the pulpit, like right there, uh, with our tape recorders, tape recording, the, tape recording that class, and somebody transcribed them, and somewhere I have, I have that in a notebook. But it's amazing, when I, last time I went back to look at that in the late 90s, there were certain things like what I just talked about with the Numa Leash Gilgamesh epic. We had to read those through in class, but so much else has been, it was dated. It's so interesting how these things change. There's so much uh, discovery uh, that comes along. We look at the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel is often thought to have been the prototype or the original of these ziggurats, these stair-stepped pyramids that were found in the area of Iran and Iraq. And there also had uh, some stair-step pyramids that showed up in, in, um, in Egypt. And then that same similar pattern showed up in Mexico and in Central America. And so it all goes back to the Tower of Babel as the, as the prototype. And a monument describing the Tower of Babel was discovered in the region of the Ur of the Chaldees, which is closer, further south than Babylon, and down near the Persian Gulf. And it speaks of a king, Ur-Namu, who was told by the gods to build a tower, and then they got mad and destroyed it and confused the languages. So you can see how the facts of what the Bible gives in a real clear-cut, non uh, mystical sort of narrative, a solid historical narrative, get twisted and changed in these in these other views. Now, the next person I want to talk about is Abraham, because Abraham is one of the key figures in the Old Testament. He is the one that God calls, makes a covenant with Abraham, promises to give Abraham the land on which he is walking, that he's going to take him to a land that God was going to give to him. And yet there's no extra biblical, really, information about Abraham. And so the liberal will come along and say that uh, Abraham was simply a... Um, just a mythological figure. He was just made up. So what do we know about Abraham? Well, Abraham lived 
some probably tw uh, 2,200 to 1,900 years, somewhere in there, before Christ. He was like a Bedouin. He wasn't a Bedouin, but he was, had a nomadic existence. He had probably had a stable existence when he grew up in Ur of the Chaldees, but when God told him to, to leave his family, leave everyone behind, uh, take Sarah, and he was going to take him to a land that he would give to him, uh, Abraham left, and from that point on, Abraham did not own the real estate on which his feet trod. And he goes north to Haran, lives there for a while until his father-in-law dies because he didn't really, or till his father died, he didn't really listen to God. And um, uh, he didn't listen to God in his directions to leave his family behind. So he's um, got some family with him. He's got his nephew Lot with him. And so after... Uh, I believe it was his father or his uncle, after they died, then he goes south uh, to the land that God has promised. And he comes down the, the mountain ridge, which is called the Way of the Patriarchs, and there was a tr uh, trading route uh, along that uh, mountainous ridge. And he comes down, the first place he stops is at Shechem. And there he uh, built an altar. And that's referred to several times in the Bible centuries later. This is where Abraham built the altar. So there was a record of that that was kept. Uh, then he left from there and he moved further south and eventually he ends up down and he settles for a good bit of time down near Beersheba and he also went down to Hebron. And Hebron, there's also an area right there that was known as Mamre, M-A-M-R-E. And this is where the, the cave of the patriarchs is, is located. And later, uh, Herod the Great will build this huge building around it to protect it. Now, the interesting thing is you have, um, you have this building built by Herod. You have nearby a church that was built by the Romans, and the Romans built these churches at the holy, not church, excuse me, they built, they had a pagan temples. And they built these pagan temples near or on these uh, Jewish holy sites and that marked them for us because they just didn't put them everywhere. So you had a, uh, a temple to Zeus that was put on the Temple Mount. And you had a temple to, I believe it was a temple to uh, Aphrodite that was put over the location of the crucifixion, which is where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is built. You had another temple that was placed over the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem. But they didn't just build them anywhere and everywhere. They built them on those holy sites because they wanted to eradicate them, and they had built one here. So if you go back in through the history, what you discover is that that you go back year, century after century after century, there are records and there are uh, structures that are built on those sites to commemorate them. And this was where uh, the Oaks of Mamre were. And this is later where uh, Abraham will buy the uh, cave at Machpelah that was owned by uh, one of uh, by a uh, Hittite who lived there, and this is a first piece of real estate that he had. So this is evidence that Abraham actually existed. This is where you have Abraham buried and Sarah, and you have Isaac and Rebecca, and you have Jacob and Leah because Rachel had died elsewhere, and she is buried near uh, near Bethlehem. So this gives us. Um, uh, evidence. Then you have some other evidence related to Moses. I'm not even going to get to Jericho, uh, Jericho tonight. Um, you have what's called the Moses inscription. Now one of the things that I did, because I like to research with people I trust, is I asked um, Petrovich, Doug Petrovich, I asked Wayne House, and I asked Randy to give me a list of what they thought were the 10 most significant archaeological discoveries that validated the Bible. 
And most of them, I would say of the 10, six were common to every list. But there were a few other differences. And the biggest one who had the most differences was Doug Petrovich because he's an Egyptologist. And so he's thinking totally in terms of what he's been publishing. And he's got these two books out now, one on the alphabet and one on the origin of the Hebrews that has just come out. And uh, so he, his first pick was the, what he calls the Moses inscription. Technically, this is known as Sinai uh, 361, and it's an inscription from Serebate el Kadim, uh, which is in central Sinai, and it's the only extra biblical witness that mentions Moses' name and is contemporary with his time of, of, of life. It's, it's dated to about the time of the Exodus, about 1446 B.C. for that dating that inscription. Not only does it mention Moses, but it noted that, quote, our bound servitude had lingered. Moses then provoked astonishment. It is a year of astonishment, unquote. So that is the Moses inscription. And uh, it is uh, supported, and it's related to the discovery of the Proto-Sinaitic Sinaitic script, which helps understand the alphabet, and that's the basis for what he, uh, what he developed in his book on the alphabet. Also, uh, there is a uh, Hebrew, the language Hebrew inscription known as Sinai 115, that comes from um, the same location, Sarabet El Kadim in Sinai, and it's the earliest reference to the uh, Israelites that's known to history. And it is, was an inscription found in a caption that relates to the drawing at the bottom of an eight to nine foot high stone stele. That's a stone monument uh, that describes the events related to uh, this uh, expedition that was seeking or seeking mines to, to mine turquoise uh, from the mines there. And the uh, caption reads, Six Levantines, Hebrews of Bethel, the Beloved. And the, draw, the drawing presents a rider mounted on a donkey with a young man standing on either side of him. So this is, this is remarkable because this is one of the things that the liberals have said is there's no evidence that the Jews were ever in, uh, in Egypt and there's no evidence of Moses or any of those people and here are two inscriptions from that time period that validate that. Uh, then there's also the uh, Sobehemkat uh, inscription and I'm not even going to describe that because it's, so, it's lengthy but that was what... Uh, Petrovich talked about when he was here in 2019, I believe, uh, the fall of 2019, and he went through about four Bible classes explaining all of that and connecting the dots and showing that, uh, that it, he believes that we have found uh, the foundations of Joseph's palace in the Delta region in, in Egypt. And that is, these things are extremely important to understand. And, of course, they're highly controversial because the, the whole archaeological establishment, especially among Egyptologists, is set firmly on the foundation that nothing in the Bible actually happened in Egypt. And so to try to break through that is ex extremely difficult. So that brings us to um, the big event, which is Jericho. And I think I can probably cover most of this um, in the next, oh, I'll take about 10 minutes. Jericho is considered to be uh, the number one challenge to the Bible. It is, of course, we all know the story of Jericho. We know the story of Joshua uh, fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. And what we know of the battle is that Jericho was a walled city, that the 
Israelites defeated it because the walls collapsed and that they uh, crawled up over the walls and into the city and burned the city and destroyed all of its inhabitants outside of Rahab and her family. Now, everybody will agree on those particular elements to the story. The issue is, have we found evidence of that in the right time period? And everybody will agree, and I'll show you some pictures of this, everybody will agree that they've got evidence that the walls collapsed, they've got evidence that the city was burned, but they can't agree on when these things happened. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the, uh, the issue there. Now, here's a location of Jericho and, and this map. Here's the Dead Sea down here. Here's Jericho, and you'll notice I had another map, but one map, when we went through, we went through this in uh, the beginning of Judges. Some have Gilgal here, some have Gilgal here. They don't know exactly where Gilgal was, but they do know where Jericho was. Everybody agrees that the uh, uh, Tel S. Sultan in modern Jer outside of modern Jericho is the biblical Jericho. Everybody, no disagreement at all on that. And from there, they're going to go and have the battle at Ai, but all we're talking about is Jericho. Now, the other thing we need to know, because most of us, myself included, always have to look at a cheat sheet to know what archaeologists are talking about when they're talking about the Bronze Age or the Iron Age. Bronze Age comes before the Iron Age, and the Bronze Age starts about 3,000. And the early Bronze Age is around 3,000 to 1,900. Middle Bronze is from 1,900 to 1,550, so that's 100 years or so roughly before the Exodus. And then the Late Bronze is from 1,550 to 1,200. So the Exodus is at 1446, and then the uh, conquest begins 40 years later in 18. I mean, in 15. Oh, 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 excuse me, 1406. And you have late bronze divided into late bronze one and late bronze two. So these are the dates. Here it's 1447 BC, but I, I, I got those from something, but I think that's wrong. 14, it, it depends. Some things are 1446, some things 1447. Anyway, it's right in that, that time period. So the, the first thing you need to know is the main excavator of Jericho was this man, John Garstang, who was born in 1876 and lives to 1956. He exca excavated Jericho twice in 1928 and 1930. Those dates are important. I'll point something out in a minute. He wrote the definitive work on Bronze Age pottery. That's important, because how do you date things? You date things by the pottery. If you can develop a, a chronology of the pottery as it develops, then you can identify what you find by the pottery that you find there. So he's not a novice. He's not overlooking the pottery that's there. He knows the pottery. He is the definitive expert on it. And uh, he recognize that Jericho existed from a remote age. Some say that it's one of the earliest cities after the flood. Now here is a map of, and I've got a couple like this, a map of the, of the tell. And it, it's oval shaped, surrounded, you can see the blue lines here, which basically reflect where the walls are. It's all color-coded. The uh, blue represents areas excavated by Germans in 1907 to 1909. See, the whole thing hasn't been excavated. That's what I'm pointing out, just small, small areas. The yellow are the areas that were excavated by Kathleen Kenyon, 1952 to 58. And then the red areas are the areas where Garstang excavated in the early 30s. Now, what important event happened in the Middle East between 19, the early 1930s and the 1950s? Hmm? 
the in Israel, Israel's independence, the founding of the state of Israel. It's really interesting that nobody after 1948 ever found any evidence of Israel being in the land early on. They found no evidence of the conquest. Karstang and others found evidence of the conquest before, is, before World War II, before, and Israel is, gets its independence in 1948. But nobody after 1948 can find Israel anywhere uh, in the, uh, this early time period. But you can see the yellow is Kenyon, the red is Garstang, so there's only a couple of places where they overlap, most notably right here. So they're really looking in some different areas. That was the main thing I noticed there. And here is, they have this big map there at the, um, at the location there in Jericho, and you can see that better than I can see it on my laptop. You have this area, well, I'm, I'm going to blow it up a little bit in the next slide, there we go. This area is where Garstang dug, dug one trench. And so you have these different trenches where he dug. Here's trench one. Here's trench three down here. And um, I, I don't see any others. Notice how you have the entry here and over here is the restrooms. Um, but you have early Bronze Age area. There's a double city wall, but that's early bronze. What we're looking at is Middle Bronze, 1800, uh, Middle Bronze 3, just off the map here, Middle Bronze, um, so that's pointing to this wall here. So this is in the time period that, that, we're, that we're looking at. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. It's hard to see it until you see it. Even if you've seen it, it's hard to put them together. This is another diagram that Bryant Wood put together to show that you have two walls. You have one outer wall, which he calls the revetment wall, and then there was a, plast a plastered rampart because it's, there's a heavy slope. I'll, you'll see that in the next uh, diagram. And then there's a, a con constructed uh, wall around the city. So there's two walls, and they look something like this. You have uh, this first revetment down here, you have an earthen embankment and then an upper city wall. What happens, according to Bryant Wood's work, is when the walls fall down, the top wall goes this way, the bottom wall goes down, and it basically creates a ramp for the Israelites to go up in, into the city. And here are... Uh, some pictures. This is uh, the tell where you have uh, the mud brick uh, collapse in front of the first uh, revetment. And this is pointed out here by Bryant Wood. He's pointing down to the collapsed wall and one layer of, of mud, mud bricks. That photograph was taken in 1997 and those bricks aren't there anymore. He writes, the meticulous work of Kenyon showed that Jericho was indeed a heavily fortified, was indeed heavily fortified, and that it had been burned by fire. Unfortunately, she misdated her finds, resulting in what seemed to be a discrepancy between the discoveries of archaeology and the Bible. She's contradicting Garstang also. She concluded that the Bronze Age city of Jericho was destroyed about 1550 B.C. by the Egyptians. An in-depth analysis of the evidence, however, reveals that the destruction took place at the end of the 15th century. That's the 1400s, around 1406-1407, uh, exactly when the Bible says the conquest occurred. And that's Bryant Wood, and he was, is a pottery expert. And Garstang was a pottery expert, and he's using all of Garstang's notes and confirms Garstang. Not only that, but after Kathleen Kenyon died, they discovered that a, a lot of pottery that she'd put in storage because it didn't fit her views. So it was, of the, you know, if the glove don't fit, you can't convict. Well, she made sure that if the, if, if the glove fit, well, they were going to take it and hide it so nobody knew it. Another thing that was discovered by Garstang is uh, this 
a metal uh, palace that's located uh, here, and they've just done a small amount of excavation, but it's believed that was the palace of Eglon. Remember Eglon in Judges chapter, uh, Judges chapter uh, 2 and 3. So these are, this is another picture of the revetment wall uh, that's there. And you see two walls here. This is the revetment wall, and this is a much earlier wall that was back here in the back. Now, I was looking at these pictures, and in this one, you can't see it real well in the picture, but you can see the stratified layers uh, down below where they've excavated. And then in this area, you see the bottom of a tower but the interesting picture is this one. Uh, unfortunately, because of the lighting, I couldn't get as much light in there as I wanted. But if you look closely, you can see this strata right in here. It was only about this deep, but it's black. It's charred. It shows that there had been a fire. And you can trace it. It goes all the way uh, up here and around the corner. And this, so it's all through here. And that's where they base the evidence, uh, evidence of, of the fire. So when you look at the data, and you can go out, and um, Joel, uh, Joel Kramer, when he first went to Israel, he tackled this as a, because it was the biggest problem facing biblical credibility. And his background was he was um, a, a, a video journalist. So he decided to do a, a film on this. He was studying. He was working. He worked with um, Bryant Wood on Jericho. No, I don't think he worked at Jericho. He worked with him on other sites. And so he put together a very good video called Jericho Unearthed. And you can get on YouTube, and you can uh, put in Joel Kramer Archaeologist, and you can find a, just a whole bunch of his videos. You can go to his website, SourceFlix, and you can see a number of videos there. You can look at the full version of Jericho on Earth. And there's a couple of things where they've had interviews about it that are also up on YouTube. And I didn't connect the dots on Joel's name for a long time. But from the first time I went to Israel, I had his video and I had ripped it and put it on my laptop. And I, before we would, after we would leave Bet Shan and we would drive south, I would put on my, my earphones and watch that video and read Bryant Wood's article. We weren't going to Jericho, but I would talk about it because we could see it 10 or 15 miles away. And I would, would uh, talk about this. And that is a great explanation. And he's done a tremendous amount of work there. So like I said, each of these things I'm talking about, you could write whole books about. You could talk two or three hours about them. But I just want you to get a basic summary of the evidence that is there that substantiates what the Bible, what the Bible says. So next time we'll come back, look at uh, more of the ones. We've got to have about eight or nine other ones for the Old Testament, and then we'll look at three or four that uh, uh, are important for New Testament studies. Most of these are just various inscriptions and uh, discoveries, for example, of Caiaphas's ossuary, demonstrating that these were real historical people. Father, we thank you for the fact that you have left uh, these evidences there to be discovered, to validate what you said in the Word, and each year there are more important finds that are discovered. And, Father, we're just thankful that these things um, just give us evidence that the Bible is precisely what you say it is. And we thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen.